The Way of Death and the Way of Life Who can bear a broken spirit? There are times when I wonder to what extent I will be able to grasp the full meaning of the Bible by the time my life in this world comes to an end. None of the countless books I read in the past were really able to satisfy me, but the Bible is different. I used to like books so much that it was reading them that gave me pleasure in life. And yet I found that no book ever gave me the sense of true peace in my heart that the Bible has given me. No other book can compare with the Bible. This Bible tells us, the spirit of a man will sustain him in sickness. But who can bear a broken spirit? Sickness of the heart is more serious than physical sickness. Physically, I was extremely ill when I was a child, and there was a time when I thought that if I lived to the age of 40, I would have had a good life. Now that I am well over 40 years old, I can think about my life once more as I look back on those extra decades I have lived. Despite my physical weaknesses, I have made very careful use of my time, not wishing to waste any of it. I decided that even if I only lived to the age of 40, I would fill my years with as much as anyone else would fill a life of 80 years. As I have lived my life in this way, the most memorable occasion was when I came to a definite belief in the Bible, having not been able to believe it before. From that day on, the more I read the Bible, the more interesting it became, and I came to see clearly that it is the Bible that gives a purpose in life and makes life worth living. Previously, I had really disliked reading the Bible, and when I did read it, it only made me sleepy. But from that day on, I loved to read my Bible. It warmed my heart, much like when I read a letter from someone I missed who was living in a distant land. I also had the desire in my heart to tell other people about it. Where are you going? In the book of Acts, it says that the people of Berea were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Even though such a great preacher had spoken to them, the people of Berea did not just accept everything Paul said without question. They examined the scriptures to see if these things were so. Such was the earnestness of their attitude towards the scriptures. We also need to have this kind of attitude, searching the Bible to see what it says. In many passages, the Bible says to keep the law and not sin. For this reason, people who sin or commit wrong acts feel the Bible is meddling in their affairs, and they are not attracted to it. Yet the Bible is actually saying something quite different from this. At the end of the Bible, we find some surprising advice. It tells us to keep on living as we are. Isn't this strange? I wonder if you have ever thought about the following verse. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Why does it happen to say this at the end of the Bible, God's Word? This verse really fascinates me. Generally, the Bible tells us to be good, not to sin, and not to do things that are wicked. But this verse is quite different. It says to let a person who is holy be holy still. But on the other hand, it also says to let him who is unjust be unjust still, and let him who is filthy be filthy still. It does not say not to do these things, does it? There is definitely a reason for this. From the beginning in the Garden of Eden, man was given the free will to live according to his instincts. Then, in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, man is given this same free will. Someone once said to me, if God hadn't made the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we probably wouldn't have had such a hard time. But God did make the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam ate from its fruit, 
and we are descended from Adam. So it is not necessary for us to talk about what if God had not made it. It would, of course, be a different matter if Adam had eaten the fruit of the tree of life before eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The source of the trouble lay in the fact that he did not eat the fruit of the tree of life that was permitted to him. But he ate the forbidden fruit of the tree of knowledge, and mankind fell into sin. In the book of Genesis it says, The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Then in the last chapter of Revelation, chapter 22, it says the tree of life was there from which all could eat freely. This is a matter under God's supreme authority. The issue is, which we are going to choose. I would like to talk about the free will that has been given to man. What have we been born into this world to do? That is to say, what is it that we are supposed to obtain having been born into this world? Some years ago, I heard that a certain elderly lady had passed away. She was an Italian, and I had seen her in a movie she had appeared in when she was young. It was a movie called La Strada, and Anthony Quinn also starred in it. I saw it when I was in elementary school, so I do not remember the story very well, but I do remember the theme song from the movie. Why am I alone, traveling down a lonely road? The young girl who sang this song with such ardor has grown old and left this world. We too will all leave this world someday. The important matter is what our purpose is and which road we walk along in the course of our lives. Each country will have its own philosophical discussions and writings about life. But are we content with the path on which we walk without any direction, the path that everybody in this world takes until the day he dies? Let's think about the trips we take from time to time. Many people enjoy traveling somewhere for vacation. After their trip, they like to talk proudly about their adventures. We are all in the process of a journey in the course of our lives. This journey of life must come to an end at some point, the only difference being that the end comes earlier for some than it does for others. No one can avoid that end. A young person may say to an elderly person, I hope you will live for many years to come. If the older person has cancer, the young person may attempt to comfort him, saying, I hope you recover soon. But the younger person may be involved in a car accident and die first. As we proceed along the journey of life, we do not know when or where our lives will come to an end. Even so, we live our lives thinking that many more days lie ahead of us. Suppose you were to stand on the corner of a busy street and ask the passerby where they are going. Each person will have his own answer. But wouldn't it be a problem if someone were to say, I have no idea where I'm going? Similarly, we are all going somewhere, and yet we do not know exactly where we are heading, and we do not have a clear sense of purpose. All we know is that at some point, we will come to the precipice by the name of death. If you ask religious people what will become of them after they die, they will probably give you a vague answer, saying they will go to a good place. Buddhists will tell you they hope to go to paradise, and Catholics will say they will first go to purgatory, and from there they will go to a good place. They all have different answers. Yet, the Bible the word of God that has been given to man gives us a very precise answer to this question. It tells us that hell definitely exists. Nevertheless, the Bible does not only condemn a person to hell after death, it also talks repeatedly and earnestly about the qualification of eternal life that is necessary in order that a person might be saved from that cursed place called hell. When it comes down to it, the words in Revelation that say, He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. 
he who is holy, let him be holy still, are telling people to choose their path as they wish. This seems to be a rather strange expression, but it is saying to do as you wish, exercising your freedom to choose, and either live your life committing sins or live your life in a holy way. A path has been set out before everyone, and the important point is on which path each individual stands. The Spirit That Is Heading for Eternity Have you ever thought, I would be happier if I had not been born in my own country, but in a country where people are better off? I was very ill when the Korean War broke out, and there was a time when I thought, why did I have to be born a citizen of this country and go through this war? Physically, I am very ill. Why did I have to be born a citizen of this country, surrounded by the sound of nothing but bombs exploding and guns firing? As time went by, however, and I came to assurance of faith through the Bible, happiness that depended on external circumstances no longer had a meaning for me. All I could think was that I was really fortunate, and it had nothing to do with my nationality or the conditions in which I lived. What would have become of me if this person, called me, had simply existed within the shell of my physical being and had never known the relief that came when I came to know this much-needed truth? The very thought of it sends shivers down my spine. A certain confidence arose within me, having assurance that this truth had been firmly established in my life that had been destined for nothing but wretchedness. This was because I had come to know that the promise of which the Bible speaks had been established within me. Jesus said of Judas Iscariot, it would have been good for that man if he had not been born. These words do not only apply to Judas Iscariot, they need to be heard by everyone born into this world. What does it matter if a person is born with black skin, white skin, or yellow skin? We all have a precious spirit within us. If man did not have a spirit inside of him, he would be no different from an animal. People are born, and in the course of their lives, when they are able to go out and earn money, they buy the things they need to dress themselves. Yet, how does the mink compare with man who must change his clothes depending on the weather? The mink is born in a perfectly fitting suit of clothes. In autumn and winter, its fur is thick and warm, and in spring and summer, its fur is thinner. It changes its clothes naturally when it molts. It is more fortunate than man in that it does not need to be concerned about the way it clothes itself. In Korea, there is a saying that goes, when a tiger dies, it leaves behind its skin, and when a person dies, he leaves behind his name. The Bible tells us that a person who dies without having received a definite answer as to why he has been born is no different from an animal. It also says that such people are like natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed. If this is the fate of man, he is in a really pitiful situation. It is quite horrifying to think about this matter. The essence of man is not the outer shell of the flesh. It is the being inside this shell. There is a certain power that controls man's hearts and his thoughts. The Bible makes a clear distinction in regard to this point. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This verse says, Your whole spirit, soul, and body. Man has a spirit, a soul, and a body. These together form a trinity. This is something that happened a long time ago. I was with some friends beside a river, and I said to them, In six months' time, I will be able to walk on that water. They all looked at me as though I was a little crazy, and they were probably thinking, He believes in Jesus, so now it seems he thinks he can imitate Jesus and walk on the water. But six months later, I did indeed walk on that water. I skated on it. Just as water has the three forms of solid, liquid, and vapor, man also is made up of spirit, soul, and body. 
Man also has three stages to his life. The time he spends in the womb, the time he spends in this world, and the time he spends in the eternal world. This is why the Bible tells us that man has a longing for eternity in his heart. Generally, people do not live any more than 100 years, and yet they tell many lies in that time. They say, for example, I will love you forever. It is because they have a longing for eternity in their hearts that people say such things even though they only live for a few decades, never mind forever. God made man in such a way that he would long for eternity. Even though the body ages, the spirit does not change, so the mind alone remains youthful. There are times when elderly people watch children running around, playing excitedly and having fun, and they themselves have fun, caught up in the atmosphere. If you ask them why they are so excited, they will tell you they are still young at heart. Their hearts are still so young because their spirits do not grow old. The Peace That the Bible Brings The spirit inside of man is proceeding towards eternity. But what has that spirit come to this world to obtain? Man born by the lonely river, what have you come to find? You may live in one way and you may live in another way. But what good is money and fame and love? Now and then, in the course of my life, the lyrics of this song I heard when I was young have come to my mind. In my young days, songs like this full of sadness and a vague longing naturally took hold of me as I tried to fill the emptiness and loneliness that, for no particular reason, arose in my heart. When I sang songs of longing for the hills and fields of youth, I gradually became more and more lonely, perhaps because I, too, would run and play in the hills and fields in my youth. Then, one day, I realized the truth in the words of the Bible, and joy and vitality took the place of the sorrow in my heart. I've cast aside all vain glory of the world, and through God's grace, many blessings now are mine. I give my heart and my body to the Lord, and serve Him in the glory of His heavenly home. Jesus Lord, Savior dear, for the sake of all my sins, was crucified and died upon the rugged cross. After that day, this became the marching song that resounded in my heart. My heart, which before had gradually become sadder and sadder when I sang or listened to music, became full of hymns, and in no time, my life changed to being full of happiness and joy. This was because of the Bible. I tried comparing all the joys that come from human life and the peace that comes from the Bible. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. When this peace that tells us not to be troubled was accomplished within me, my whole life changed. The songs I sang also changed, and I was always full of joy, even when I was alone. At times, I would look in the mirror and think, You have become very strange. I almost did not recognize myself, and I was beside myself with joy. There's a peace in my heart that the world never gave, a peace it cannot take away. Though the trials of life may surround like a cloud, I've peace that has come there to stay. Constantly abiding, Jesus is mine. Constantly abiding, rapture divine. He never leaves me lonely. Whispers, oh so kind, I will never leave thee, Jesus is mine. The warm power that engulfed my heart is not something that can be bought with money. Nothing in the world can take the place of the peace the Bible brings. The Two Paths Along Which Man Has Lived Through the Bible, I found that man compromises spirit, soul, and body. And God is also a trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The God, who was, and is, 
and is to come, is one God, the triune God. Having been made in the image of God, man has religious tendencies. But this is not the case for animals. No matter how well you may train a monkey, it will not know how to make offerings to some being or how to pray. Not even the more intelligent gorilla will be able to do this. When it comes to man, however, people have religions whether they are living in less developed societies or in the most advanced nations. Man seeks God and has a longing for eternity in his heart. Man, formed by God, lives in this world until the day that God calls him. Our physical bodies, the earth, and the universe are all proceeding according to God's laws. The blood in our bodies is pumped from the heart down to the toes and back again in a matter of seconds, and then it proceeds up to the head and out to the fingertips and back again. As the blood continues to circulate in this way, new cells are formed and aging cells are revived. Also, man grows older as the earth rotates on its axis and orbits the sun. The universe is moving according to natural laws, and man spends his time in the midst of all this until the time comes for him to stand before the one who created all these things. How are we going to appear before him? Everyone is destined to stand before God, whether they believe in him or not. We are born and live in this world, and God has given us his word in the form of the Bible. This is what is required for our happiness. Nevertheless, if we turn our backs on the Bible, even though it is right in front of us, we are rejecting happiness itself, and we come to languish in sorrow. We have, of course, been given the freedom to choose. The Bible tells us to do as we please, but it also gives us the following warning. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. This verse is telling us that ultimately everyone dies, but man is to live uprightly on the path that the Bible sets before him. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 16, we read about the time when the lives led by two different people are clearly revealed. Jesus spoke about these two people. One of them came to suffer eternally, and the other came to enjoy eternal peace and happiness. The first of these two men was very rich, was clothed in fine linen, and lived in luxury, feasting every day. His name is not given, but it says he spent his days feasting in this way. The other man was a beggar by the name of Lazarus, and he lay at the rich man's gate. His clothes were in rags, he was covered with sores, and he longed to fill his stomach with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. One day, these two men died. Someone probably buried the beggar's body somewhere quietly, but the rich man would have had a very lavish funeral. After these two men died, However, they each went to a completely different place. When the rich man opened his eyes, he was in torment and could see that Lazarus, the beggar who had lain at his door, was now resting in the bosom of Abraham. He cried out to Abraham, saying, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. Yet Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He said very clearly, that no one could cross over from there to here, or from here to there. Many people think, if they believe in their own way, or follow the methods of the religion they have adopted, they will probably go to the kingdom of God. But such vague thoughts will get them nowhere. The Bible tells us to let your yes be yes, 
and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. It tells us to clearly distinguish between black and white. Yet, even though people have Bibles, many of them have no idea what will happen to them at the end of their lives. There are even people who teach others, and yet they themselves know nothing at all. In the Bible, it says, Cursed is the one who makes the blind to wander off the road. Everyone in the world is born blind. They have neither the eyes to see God, nor the ears to hear His word. There are times when we become sleepy when reading the Bible or listening to a sermon. It may be that we are sleepy, but it may also be that our ears to hear the words of God have become dull. Even though Jesus said clearly to his disciples, Blessed are your eyes for they see, and your ears for they hear, they did not understand what he meant, because their eyes had not yet been opened. Jesus then said, For assuredly I say to you, that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. Even though the Jews came close to Jesus, they did not know what his words meant. Jesus said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. God, the Lord of eternal life, sent his Son and promised to give life through that Son. But people did not recognize the Son. Jesus asked his disciples, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They answered, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Then Jesus asked them, But who do you say that I am? This is how Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Thereupon Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. This was a time when people could not use the word Christ freely. Christ means Messiah or Savior. The Christ was the hope of all the Jews, the one they were waiting for. The Jews put tremendous hopes in the great Christ who was to come someday and lead them, freeing them from the distress of being oppressed by other nations. When Peter said Jesus was the Christ, Jesus said it was not flesh and blood but the Holy Spirit that had revealed this to Peter. In other words, it was God who had told it to him. Then Jesus said, On this rock I will build my church. This rock is Jesus, whom Peter acknowledged as Lord. The church would be built on Jesus. This is what he was explaining. This is recorded in the Bible. It is true that the name Peter means rock. But if you read right through the Old and New Testaments, you will find that the only rock is Jesus Christ. Jesus did not say, Peter, who do men say that you are? These words have been translated into the languages of each nation. When interpreting these words, we need only read them just as they have been written. Yet, people who misunderstand this passage have changed it to mean that Peter is the rock. This has been the greatest fallacy in the 2,000-year history of Christianity. Who knows how many people have misinterpreted the Bible, stumbled, and been cast out eternally as a result? When I consider this tendency to misinterpret the Bible, it seems to me that it is important to cultivate the eyes to be able to discern the Bible clearly. We need to be able to enjoy the eternal blessing received through the Bible. We need to be resolved to compose our thoughts as we read the Bible. The way of man is not in himself. As we read the Bible, we find there is no one more unfortunate than the person who is unable to discover which path he is standing on. This is like someone who has a mirror but is not able to see his face in it. If he has a problem with the retina in his eyes, or he has lost his sight, he will not be able to see himself 
even if he has a mirror. The words of the Bible are a mirror for our spirit. The Bible says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Through the Bible, we need to examine ourselves and find out precisely where we are going along the path of life. Yet, many people take no interest in this most important of matters. As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues, they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. The path of life is nothing but destruction and misery. Let's think about this on a national level. From time to time, countries make alliances with one another so as not to be massacred or driven into civil war. We sometimes see television news reports that show footage of the leaders of enemy nations shaking hands with one another in pursuit of their own interests. They make a show of calling for disarmament even though they have made the preparations to be able to drop atomic bombs that would result in terrible carnage and turn the earth into a sea of fire. But what is actually happening? Koreans sing the song that includes the lines, Come unification, come. Our dreams and hopes are for unification. But would we really be happy if unification of North and South were accomplished? We might be happy for a short time, but not forever. Confrontations between ideologies such as there were in the past may have disappeared now, but the fear of war still exists as it always has. National leaders are being extremely careful since they never know when the hearts of the people will change. If you were to ask any of the world leaders if they would order the death of anyone, they will tell you that that is the kind of deed the mafia or gangsters would carry out. They say that, but they designate a huge amount of money from their budgets for the development of defensive weapons, assault weapons, and weapons of mass destruction. If we think about matters such as these, we can see that things are happening just as the Bible says, destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. The Bible also says, he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. People do not know that God will laugh at them. Now let's consider our own personal problems. The Bible says, Blessed is the man who endures. But there is a limit to a person's endurance. Religious people may memorize the words, Blessed is the man who endures. And they may pray, asking God to help them to overcome when they face certain trials. Yet, if their pride is hurt or they are badly insulted, even though they try to be patient and endure, anger will surge up inside them and suddenly explode from them. This is why the Bible says, their feet are swift to shed blood. This applies to the individual as well. Man cannot predict his own path. This is also true of the history of mankind and of each individual nation. One thing is certain, there has been no end to war. Nevertheless, the time will come when war will also come to an end. When we read the Bible, we can see that the day will come when such matters will be resolved. The history of mankind is unfolding in accordance with the Bible but people are very ignorant of what the Bible says. There is no way that man can escape from the Bible. The history of mankind is unfolding in accordance with the blessings and curses set out in the Bible. 
You are great in counsel and mighty in work, for your eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men, to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Each person is walking along his own path, but God's eyes are on all the ways of all mankind. How can we possibly avoid his gaze? Man has no way of avoiding it. Since God created man, since he formed man as the creator, he knows all the ways of man. It may seem as though man is walking his own path as he sees fit. But as God's creation, man is subordinate to God. Just as man, God's creation comprises three parts, spirit, soul, and flesh. The same is true of the heavens above us. When we look up from the earth, we can see the clouds moving around in the atmosphere. The part of the atmosphere that contains air that we can breathe extends no more than a few miles high. The higher up you go, the less oxygen there is. Even if you just climb a high mountain, there will not be enough oxygen at the top. This layer of oxygen surrounding the earth is referred to as the first heaven. Above the atmosphere is the second heaven, where the countless stars and other heavenly bodies exist. In the book of Job in the Old Testament, it says, He stretches out the north over empty space. He hangs the earth on nothing. These words were recorded about 3,800 years ago. It says that he stretches out the north over empty space. Astronomers say there is an empty area in space that is almost completely void of stars. They were all astonished to discover this empty space in the northern skies that corresponds to what the Bible says. How is it possible in those days, in the distant past, when people had long claimed that the earth rested on the back of a huge turtle or on the shoulders of some god, that it was written that the earth was hung on nothing. Above this earth that hangs on nothing, there is the second heaven which houses countless stars, and beyond that there seems to be complete emptiness. That is the third heaven. To our human eyes, it seems to be empty, but the time will come when we will be able to see that heaven. That is the place where God is seated. Many years ago, the Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin went up in space and said he could not see God there. This is just like a flea sitting on the back of a cow, saying it cannot see the cow. In the universe, there is a place where God is. Someday, the throne of God will come down to this earth, and the earth will be completely changed. Until that time, God will continue to scrutinize the lives of all mankind. O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. You are great in counsel and mighty in work, for your eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men, to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. It is only through the Bible that we can find the answer to the question, Where am I standing along this way? Now you shall say to this people, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. He who remains in this city shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. But he who goes out and defects to the Chaldeans who besiege you he shall live, and his life shall be as a prize to him. The way of life and the way of death lie before us. In other words, the way of a blessing and the way of a curse. One is the way to receive eternal life, and the other is the way that leads to the eternal hell. God has definitely given us the right to choose either one of these two ways. 
and yet people tend not to take much interest in this matter. In this way, they are bringing about their own destruction. Even though they are afraid of death, they seem to think nothing of it, taking the attitude that once you die, that is the end of everything. In that case, rather than considering matters of the flesh, what about the suffering of the spirit? Sometimes people talk about being sick at heart. Why do you feel sad, and why is your mind troubled at times? Why are there times when you are distressed, indignant, and frustrated, and the frustration and resentment build up inside you? There is something inside each one of us that torments us, even though we cannot actually see what it is. This is why God has said to us, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. This passage is telling us that God's thoughts are on a different level to the thoughts of man. Man lives his busy life caught up in his own thoughts, not knowing what he is living for. Yet God has designated his own way, which is completely different from the way of man. The Bible is telling us that just as man's thoughts and God's thoughts are different, God's way is different from man's way. Call upon him while he is near. There was a time when Jesus stood before Pilate, the governor who had been dispatched from Rome, and spoke about the truth that was unknown to all mankind. He also said to his disciple, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am reminded of a scene from a movie I saw when I was young. A mother monkey was crossing a precipice with her young. First, she jumped from the branch of a tree on one side to the branch of a tree on the other side. She curled her tail around the branch on one side and clung on to the branch on the other side so that she formed a bridge and her young could climb across her back. When they were all safely on the other side, she swung across herself. This demonstrates extraordinary wisdom. The only way the young could cross the precipice was along her mother's back. Man is inevitably destined for hell. And if there is one way that will allow us to avoid this fate, it is the way of which Jesus was speaking when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It is the way that God has set before man, the way of which he spoke when he said, My ways are not your ways. Man has been born in order to walk this path. The Bible says, The days of our lives are seventy years, and if by reason of strength they are eighty years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow. We have been born into this world so that in the course of our futile lives we might obtain the eternal life referred to in the words, I am the life. Man's reason and purpose in being born into this world is to come to know this truth. The answer is very clear and simple. In other words, nothing is needed from us. We cling to our appetite for things like food and clothing that provide us with physical comfort. But God has provided the way of salvation so that man in his miserable state can live eternally in the eternal place. And now he is waiting for us. The Bible tells us that a place has been designated where those who have received eternal life will live eternally. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 55. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, 
and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God has given man the tremendous blessing of what is referred to as salvation. Nevertheless, man has lived his life ignoring these words of blessing, and he continues to live in this way even now. There is no way to be forgiven for the sin of treating with indifference this tremendous blessing that has been given to every one of us. The sin is not a matter of the sins we have committed in the course of our lives. It is a matter of what a person has thought of God and of Jesus whom God sent. We need to be aware that our thoughts cannot surpass the thoughts of God. God has told us clearly man's aim and reason for being born into this world. The way in which an individual's life comes to an end and the way in which the history of mankind comes to an end, is all set out in God's plan. The answer is already given in the Bible. The world, however, has not been able to provide an answer. None of man's studies from kindergarten through to graduate school provide us with the answer or the way. We are merely taught how to survive in the struggle for existence and we are given the skills to fight in this battle. Even though a person may develop these skills, the world is full of inconsistencies. People learn how to earn money and how to get a good job, but no one is interested in the art of using money, and neither is this taught anywhere. Also, people use their human wisdom to prepare for old age so that they will be able to live happily in their latter years. The state provides pensions from the taxes people have paid, providing enough to live on. Even so, no one can block the path to death, and yet people are not taught why the spirit leaves the body or what becomes of it after that. The Bible holds a definite answer to all this, but people tend to live their lives and go to their deaths without giving much thought to such matters. There are also people who are under the delusion that if they are enrolled in some Christian denomination or other religion, God will overlook their faults. Yet God does not forgive those who do not know why He has given the Bible to mankind. The Bible says to enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. There are people who mistakenly think the chapel where they worship is the narrow gate because it is so small and modest. They think the way of religion is the acceptable way. Perhaps they comfort themselves with the fact that they belong to some religion. They have been part of their religion since their childhood, and they have continued to study their religion. Yet faith does not come about as a result of study. It is only life that gives birth to life. It is only when a person is born of such life that he can be said to be a son of God or a child of God. In other words, a person must be born again. The Word of Life That Came Down From Heaven Early on, Jesus said to a man by the name of Nicodemus, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus had become very interested in the things Jesus had been doing. And so he came to him and said, When I see what you have been doing, it is clear to me, that you are a teacher come from heaven. To this Jesus replied that a person needs to be born again. Then Nicodemus asked, How can a person be born again when he is old? Must he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? Then Jesus answered, 
Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus said twice that a person must be born again. Yet, people use this expression, born again, in regard to all kinds of other matters. They say things, like society needs to be born again, or some organization needs to be born again. Such aims can be achieved with human determination. But this is not what Jesus was talking about when he spoke of being born again. Being born again is a matter of the spirit of an individual receiving new life from God. The Bible is telling all mankind that we have been born with the blood of Adam, the forefather of all mankind. But it also promises that we can be born again through the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is the only way that we can enter the kingdom of God. Even so, people do not take much interest in such matters. Some people register their names at a church, which they then attend for a long time. They are recognized by their church, given certain duties and responsibilities, and think they are working hard for God. They may even travel as a missionary to a distant land and preach the gospel there, or work hard at their own personal business, earn a lot of money, and make large donations to their church. Yet God does not take these things into consideration. God considers whether a person is born again, whether a person has received life. If you ask people what their aim is in reading the Bible, many may tell you they read it because the Bible is food for the Spirit. Yet, the Bible cannot be food for the spirit of a person who is not born again. What would happen if you were to put food into the mouth of a dead person? The Bible can only be food for a person whose spirit is born again. For this reason, as we read the Bible, we need to be certain whether we ourselves are born again. You must not allow yourself to rest at ease as long as this matter is not resolved for you, even if your name is registered with some religious body. You must not rest at ease, even if you are acknowledged by a religious leader in a high position. Who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The Bible clearly explains its purpose. It is not enough to be acknowledged by man. This is of no use if a person has not been born again through the word of God. First, we must know the reason the Bible has been given to man. God has given us the Bible so that we can find out whether we have entered the way of truth, whether we have escaped from the way of death and have properly embarked upon the way of life. The Scriptures Testify of Me One day, Jesus went out to speak about the Scriptures, and many people followed Him. As they followed Him around, they also received bread from Him. As a result, people even thought it would be good if they could make Him their king. Some followed Him around with the intention of taking Him and making Him their king. At that time, Jesus said, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life. What is meant by the food which perishes? Freshly baked bread, fresh milk, all the foods we eat will someday decay and disappear, as will our flesh. Jesus was saying that we are not to live only for the sake of such food, the food we eat to survive. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. The one who gives the food which endures to everlasting life is Jesus, the Son of God. 
and this is what he has promised us. The people who heard these words from Jesus at that time thought they had to throw themselves into doing the work of God. So they asked Jesus again. Then they said to him, What shall we do, that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. There will be many people who have believed in Jesus in one way or another as they live their lives in this world. Generally, everyone who attends church and listens to sermons thinks this is what it is to believe in Jesus. Yet, in this verse, the notion of eternal life is also included in the word believe. A person who does not have assurance of eternal life is not qualified to live in the eternal heaven. It is very dangerous to fall into the absurd kind of faith that believes God will accept you after you die because you have attended church regularly. This kind of superstition has been created by many leaders in the religious world. It is truly reckless to think that God will overlook your mistakes after you die, even though it has not happened during your lifetime. You are living in the flesh now, but the moment your spirit departs, you will be in the hands of God. Then, if you have ignored the word of God, no one will be able to help you. The Bible itself tells us why we should read it. Jesus said, But you do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent, him you do not believe. You search the scriptures, for in them, you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me, that you may have life. In other words, there was no room for God's word to abide in their spirits. This is because they did not believe God, who sent his son Jesus. Here in verse 39, we have the aim in reading the Bible. We think we read the Bible to receive eternal life. And yet, the scriptures testify of Jesus. The Bible was recorded to tell of Jesus, the real truth, and the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It is to receive this eternal life that we read the Bible. It is only when we are given this eternal life that we are able to go to the eternal place and live there forever. People often think that even though their lives in this world are difficult to bear, after they die, they will go to heaven and live comfortably there. They may entertain these idle fancies, but the Bible is definitely not vague like that. When Jesus spoke to Nicodemus, a religious leader of the Jews, he said very clearly, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This is the fundamental truth of Christianity. And it is what makes it different from any religion. All religions, including Christianity, when it exists merely as an empty shell, are ignorant of this absolute truth. Even the religion known as Christianity is no different from any other religion if it is oblivious of this fundamental truth. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Any Christian denomination is meaningless without this truth that is revealed. What use is religion if eternal life is not poured out into the hearts of the believers? If their efforts and hard work come to nothing in the end, they are in a truly wretched situation. Suppose they work as hard as they can but then they find they cannot enter the kingdom of God. It is vitally important to remember that we have been born in order to receive eternal life. Eternal life has the power to enable us to see the kingdom of God in our hearts. Certain Pharisees came to Jesus and asked him when the kingdom of God would come. Jesus replied, The kingdom of God does not come with observation 
nor will they say, See here, or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. He said, The kingdom of God is within you. But you need to be born again to be able to see this kingdom. Being born again is receiving eternal life, and a person must receive eternal life to be able to live forever in the eternal kingdom. This is God's promise. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. It is a sure fact that a person will go to hell when he dies if he does not know God. Even the guarantee provided by some worldwide religious organization will be of no use. Once a person has gone, that is the end of the matter. This is precisely what Jesus was saying. Even though it is recorded so clearly like this in the Bible, many people become caught up in the sweet words of those who do not know the truth, and they live their lives in a state of confusion. They mistakenly think they will have an opportunity even after they die. Once your spirit leaves your body, however, God takes charge of it. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, and it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. Revelation chapter 20 presents a monumental scene. All the people who have lived in this world stand before the judgment seat of God, and those whose names are not written in the book of life are clothed in new bodies and cast into the lake of fire. This is hell. When a person dies, he may be cremated, or his body may decay in the ground, but his physical body still remains on the earth somewhere. It is simply that it has turned into elements through chemical action. The day will come at some point when God will bring them back together again. At that time, a person's spirit will be clothed once more in his body. Then those who have died at sea will rise up, and death and Hades will deliver up the dead who are in them. Their spirit, soul, and flesh will be united once more. When a person dies, he does not just disappear in a puff of smoke and end up in hell or heaven. When a person's spirit departs from his body, his body disappears for a short time. But when God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, gathers all those elements together once more, everyone will rise from the dead. The resurrection will take place. But this is the resurrection to death, which is completely different from the resurrection to life. This is the destiny that has been given to man. It is in order to avoid this fate that we are living in this world. We might not like to believe this, but it is undeniable. It is in fact extremely foolish to deny it. The Bible says clearly, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. The following is a story I heard from a person who once lived in Manchuria. Once in a while, you see pheasants flying across the wide plains of Manchuria, and people go out to catch them. Pheasants walk very quickly, but they cannot fly very far, so people chase them with sticks. The pheasants run for their lives, and then, when they are exhausted and can run no further, they go over a hill and bury their heads in the snow. Just because they cannot see the people who are hunting them down, it does not mean the hunters are not coming but because they cannot see the hunters, they think they are safe. The hunters need only take hold of the pheasants' tails and pull, and they can easily bag them. The situation does not change, even though people fill their ignorance with their own thoughts, not knowing the Bible or the Word of God. What are they to do about the indisputable fact that hell exists and there is no way they can avoid it? For this reason, God has given us his word that says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. First, you need to break away from the mistaken idea that if you do badly, you will go to hell, and if you do well, you will go to heaven. Then when you hear the words of the Bible, 
you need to listen through to the end, even if you do not like what you are hearing. What does the Bible mean when it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he is near? If you are caught up in your own thoughts, there will be times when you come to dislike the Bible. I once read a story about something that happened long ago in England. There was a rich man who had a son, but that son led a life of such wantonness that his father was left feeling deeply hurt. Then one day, the father died. The son had lived out in the world just as he pleased, and then one day he came home and found that his father had died and his will had been left in the care of a lawyer. The lawyer sat the son down and began to read the will to him. It said, When my son was born, he was very innocent and cute. I loved him deeply, and so I gave him the best of everything. But as he grew up, he made friends with the wrong sort of people. He lost his way and ended up in prison. So I found a lawyer and bailed him out. I did everything I could for him, but he just continued to follow this path of crime. As the son listened to the reading of the will, he began to squirm around in his seat uncomfortably until he angrily stormed out of the room, even though the lawyer had told him he had to listen to the end. After he had gone, the lawyer continued to read the will to the end. But now my life is at an end, and I am desperate for my son. When he returns, if he listens to this will to the end, I will give him my entire estate. But if he lets his anger get the better of him and leaves before the reading of the will reaches the end, I leave everything I have to those less fortunate. Since the son did not listen to the end of the reading of the will, he was not able to receive the inheritance that his father had left him out of his love for him. It is the same when it comes to the Bible. God has given a huge blessing to mankind from the creation right until the very end. But man ignores it and does not have the patience to read it to the end, and so he remains on the path to hell. This is a truly wretched situation. It was in order to block people from going down this terrible path that Jesus came in person and, as he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He explained everything precisely so that we might come to believe. Even so, people turn their backs on this truth, taking it lightly and just carrying on with their lives. Perhaps this is because they are guilty of sin, but instead of trying to find out what the truth is, they allow their interests to go in another direction. Not only do they refrain from listening to God's word, they do not even look for an opportunity to do this. The Bible asks us to strive to enter through the narrow gate. We need to enter through the narrow gate. You need to change the direction of your life to walk along the narrow way. You need, first of all, to focus your thoughts on the reality of the life you are living now. Examine the Bible to see what God's Word is actually saying, and try to find what the Bible is saying to you. You need to look back on the life you have lived until now and ask yourself if you can think of God as your Father, and if Jesus Christ, whom you have always ignored, is truly your Savior. These are matters that demand your consideration. The moment you come to know this for certain and receive Jesus as your Lord will be the moment you are born again. The moment you are born again, you will know the reason and purpose for your being born into this world. You will also come to know that God's Word is your spiritual food in the course of your life. When we draw near to God's Word, the Bible leads us along a good path and God shows us the tremendous promises He has made to us. So it is that you will know without a doubt that Jesus' purpose in coming to this world was for you.